new day dawns in the Palestinian territories. Decades of conflict in the West Bank and Gaza have left political and social scars. Until recently, tackling corruption was not a top priority. There were other concerns that seemed more pressing. There is one group that has emerged to fight corruption in Palestine. Founded by prominent politicians and NGO activists, accountability and government transparency are central to their agenda. For 10 years, when I started to speak about the transparency, it was something that the people didn't understand. What does this mean? Transparency, accountability, even at that time, Yasser Arafat asked me, what the meaning of accountability? You are bringing some values and ideas from the West. One argument was you're under occupation. Why are you challenging your own people? And we said that's precisely because we've lived under oppression. We've lived under occupation. We're setting up our own institutions, our own system of governance. We owe it to ourselves to build the best possible system where we would feel responsible enough and brave enough to challenge in peaceful ways, our own leadership. In a sense, uh, we felt it was uh, doing people a, the cause, the justice that it deserved, and at the same time starting the nation-building process on a proper footing. The pressure group Aman was formed, one of many independent groups around the world that are now part of the Transparency International Network. The aim is to eradicate corruption from top to bottom, pressure at the top and action at the bottom. In encouraging ordinary people to speak out about corruption, the Advocacy and Legal Advice Centre was born. He was an employee in a factory and he's already been to the union, so he has union rights. Within a year, the new centre received nearly 1,000 complaints and inquiries. And government employees were among those who have taken the chance to work with the centre in confronting corruption. Is his complaint against the factory? One of the first to call the new centre was Mohammed Halak. All this driving round I do, I'm looking to catch the cars being misused. And I also check that they are parked at the government offices. Mohammed is an official in the Ministry of Transport. He was becoming dismayed by the widespread use of government cars for private purposes. And every car I see parked where it should be, I consider it a big achievement. I know them all, like my children. Thousands of dollars were being lost to the government every day, on petrol alone. It's about the cost of the ministry to the community. It could go to poor families. Schools need improvements. Hospitals need equipping. Working closely with Mohammed, the Advocacy and Legal Advice Centre launched a big publicity drive and a hotline for members of the public to ring in with reports of government car misuse. With radio announcements and billboards in the streets, thousands took the opportunity to phone in, many taking pictures on their phones of offending motorists. And Mohammed's work colleagues also got involved. He runs a busy office. They're responsible for managing over 7,000 government cars. He's inspired his fellow workers and they all support the work of the Advocacy and Legal Advice Centre.
As director of the center, Hama Zidane regularly visits those who have called in with reports of corruption. But she's well aware this work is not supported by everyone. We do have a lot of fans, and of course we do have a lot of enemies, because when, when you are talking about corruption, there is this target of people who are benefiting from it. So we did have some problems when we were working on the misuse of public vehicles. We did face a lot of problems with people who will lose the cars that they are using. But on the other side, most of the Palestinians, the normal citizen, they were really happy with that. And they were cooperating all the time, reporting about misuse of cars. So we do have those and those, both, both, both sides, enemies and friends. But I do believe that our friends are much more than our enemies. Dawood Namroti, a father of four from Nablus, counts himself as one of the center's friends. It was an incident of corrupt police practice that led him to turn to Hama for help. There is a person who arrested my sons and took them to the police station, to the police station in Nablus. In the police station, they were shot. The young men survived, but they were both left permanently disabled. The policeman responsible walked free. This is the family shop from where Daoud's sons were taken after an argument. They can't work here anymore. It's now unused and in disrepair. The perpetrator was sentenced to five and a half years, but he had friends in the security forces and the court decision wasn't implemented. After the judgment was given, the man escaped justice. He was sentenced to five and a half years. Then I would see him on the street. I'd be fuming. My children and my flesh and blood. I couldn't see him and do nothing. The man should pay for what he did. I won't lie to you about how I felt. It was driving me mad. How was I going to get justice? The government was failing. Who should I complain to? Dawood tried all the official channels he could in his efforts to get the sentence of the court upheld. But all was to no avail. Still, the guilty policeman continued to walk free. The very people who should have been enforcing the law were saying he was missing and they couldn't find him. When I was knocking on doors and saying who I was, I was scared of what might happen to me. When someone's harmed your children and he's still walking freely on the streets, it was destroying me. And then Dawood heard about the Advocacy and Legal Advice Center. Straight away, he called Hama and her team, asking them for help. The intervention of the center and their alerting higher authorities to the situation led to the rogue policeman being re-arrested and imprisoned. He was now to serve his sentence. And in a twist to this story, further pressure has led directly to the release of other detainees held illegally and without authority. For others, the center has managed to have illegal insurance fees charged by some local councils quashed and they've succeeded in lobbying for the introduction of new bylaws to ease the clogging of the court system. They've also highlighted irregularities in council accounts and conflicts of interest in government tenders. And the campaign against the misuse of government cars has had dramatic results. The money saved amounts to more than seven million dollars annually and Mohammed has been nominated for a Special Integrity Award. This is a big mall. Most people come here. So there's always lots of cars. I come here every day to check, to drive around a little, looking for government license plates. 
But there are fewer and fewer. Often there are none. In the past, there were many, lots of red plates. Now there is only ever one or two. Oh, here is one in front of me. A Skoda. Tomorrow we'll check up on it. So just one here at the mall. That makes me really happy. Post-conflict areas are particularly susceptible to corruption. Institutions can be fragile. Good governance hasn't had time to take root yet. It needs a change of mindset. With their ongoing experience of occupation, the relative success of the efforts being made in Palestine to fight corruption has taken many by surprise. Our case is unique because on the one hand we are a people emerging from a corrupt and corrupting occupation system of really abnormal system of intrusion and, and control. And most Palestinians resent authority and resent the government and resent systems of control. On the other hand, we had the leadership coming back from exile, uh, emerging from an experience of armed resistance, armed struggle, revolution. A revolution is something you carry out in the dark, underground, you know, with the uh, organizational principles that do not at all carry into uh, institution building, nation building, rule of law, and so on. So we felt we needed to carry out this transition in a way that would do our people a justice. The Advocacy and Legal Advice Center has played its part in challenging the system. There are currently more than 50 other such centers doing similar work in countries across the globe, all run by local Transparency International chapters. Often, cases highlight a widespread problem. And so, as well as fighting for the individual, they push for systemic change. Here in the West Bank, their influence goes right to the top. I mean, there's nothing in the law that says you have to answer uh, uh, an organization like, like uh, Amman. Uh, but we do, uh, and we listen to what they have to say. Again, out of uh, belief and firm conviction, uh, they have a very important role to play. And here we are. Uh, where we are today is vastly superior to where we were uh, last year, year before, and so on and so forth. Even a verbal commitment to the cause by those in power is itself a sign of progress. Transparency is now a popular word in the West Bank. The speed with which we get to the point where we have institutions that measure up in integrity and performance to high international standards, I think that's really the real test. And this is a key area, as a matter of fact, transparency. On the whole, people accept and welcome this. They understand that it isn't about punishing people for the sake of it, but about making our country one with standards. The law has to be respected, even though here sometimes the government seems to be absent. First of all, by being there, I mean, that itself is, is, is helpful, uh, because it really opens up the system. We see doing these things as an integral part of the national effort aimed at getting us to freedom and independence. The more we're able to assert with credibility uh, that we measure up in performance and the, in the integrity, uh, structural integrity of our institutions, uh, the better positioned we are. So we value their existence, their activity, and what it is they do. One of the advice center's most important goals is encouraging people to speak out and protecting those who do. It's largely fear and lack of knowledge that prevents the victims of corruption from standing up for their legal rights and stop the witnesses of corruption from coming forward. Faraj Haft was summarily dismissed from his government job for political reasons. For years, he wasn't given the money he was due. But that all changed the day he called the advice line. Most places you call them and they don't even pick up the phone. I had that for four years. But with a man, in less than a month, I got all the money I was owed. In less than a month. Faraj was fired, along with others in the same position, when his political bosses were replaced. He then seemed blacklisted, unable to find work and unable to support his young family. This is a form of corruption that Farage thinks has to be confronted. 
كنتش متوقع في مؤسسة في فلسطين. I couldn't believe there was an organization here in Palestine that could be so efficient. People talk about the police and the government, but you can't rely on them. Go to someone who will look after you and communicate your message. Faraj's case highlights the importance of ordinary people speaking out. And having received proper legal advice from Hammer and her team, he was paid all the money that was due to him, and he's now found work in a car showroom. The centre does all it can to get to the root of the problem, so that others might follow in Faraj's footsteps, and it takes its message directly to the public. If something's wrong, it should be confronted. And this message has been communicated well to the people. If we did the same tour a couple of years ago, we might have found 50 cars not in their proper parking spaces. We've been going two hours and we've caught two cars. I've made a note of the place and the license plates. Some people interpret the law about car use as exempting higher government officials. Mohammed disagrees. It compromises his campaign. Every car he sees, he'll inquire about it the next day. I know who this is. I don't even need to write it down. I know the number by heart. Tomorrow I'll ask him why he was coming to the mall. Faraj is now determined that others should benefit as he has done. He wants more people to stand up for their rights, and he's eager to exert a bit of pressure of his own. After we dealt with your complaint and we were successful, we've had a lot of similar complaints from people in the same situation. They've probably been elsewhere first and didn't get any help. Many people need your help, people who have been sacked for corrupt reasons. You must try to help these people. You need to publicize yourselves more, then others will come to you. You see, one, if you, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All the cars are here. I've told many other people about it and about the success that I've had. Not all of them have come to us. Is it because they're afraid? They might not be afraid. They might just not realize that anything can be done. And they could need you more than I did. Oh, oh good. All the cars is here. It's International Anti-Corruption Day. And Transparency Palestine have organized a gala event in Ramallah to bring together all those fighting corruption in Palestine. A special guest is Transparency International's managing director, Cobus de Swart. Not only are we proud of the work that our Palestinian chapter is doing, but that work is highly regarded in the international movement as a member that in many ways are leading the way in putting corruption under difficult circumstances often at the center stage in the struggle for social justice. And it's the work of the Advocacy and Legal Advice Center, the ALAC, that's particularly impressed Cobus. Over the last couple of years, uh, this has indeed been one of the key initiatives of Transparency International worldwide. We have seen over the last couple of years, in particular uh, across the world, that ordinary citizens care immensely about corruption. In order to give an avenue for ordinary citizens, we created these advocacy and legal advice centers. Our ALAC uh, uh, here uh, in Palestine has been particularly uh, effective. It's one of our younger ALACs. It's one of the best. There is one group which hasn't been able to make it, the Transparency Palestine workers based in Gaza, but they have an audio link to the event. They have an active local office, working under very difficult circumstances, and are unable to leave the Gaza Strip. In many other countries, anti-corruption activists look to the work of Transparency Palestine as an example of what can be done. And here, the work of the ALAC is getting special attention. 
It's at this event that Mohammed is up for a Transparency Palestine Integrity Award. He has been chosen as the individual worker who has achieved most in the drive against corruption. And his family are around him to share the moment. As a step towards building healthy state institutions, and so as a step to statehood itself, Mohammed and his family want all Palestinians to join them in their struggle against corruption. I'm very pleased with this award, and we will continue with our work from here. And I encourage my colleagues to continue with this work, and everyone to do what they have to do without being scared. I have raised my child and he is brave. He'll be continuing his work. I hope that every mother could be as happy for her son as I am for my Muhammad. It's a sign of the changing culture that rather than finding it an annoying intrusion, Muhammad's bosses in the Ministry of Transport welcomed the scrutiny of an outside organization. Without the help of the Palestinian citizens, we can't succeed. Awareness needs to be raised in the whole community. We won't get anywhere without transparency and honesty. They are a bridge from the community to the ministry, and our services have improved as a result. Transparency is important. Good governance is important anywhere in the world. In the Palestinian context, it means that which it means in every other country, anywhere in the world, plus something else. It has that special importance, which means it closer and closer to the goal of being able to live as free people uh, in a country of our own. Winning the award is not the end of the campaign for Mohammed. Some of the higher government officials have taken the issue to court, looking for an official judgment that they're exempt from the law prohibiting the use of government cars after hours. Mohammed and his colleagues think this would be a backward step, and to gauge support and do spot checks on government cars, they've organized a nighttime roadblock. We stopped you and checked your car. Are you annoyed I stopped you? No, no, not at all. I'm a government employee. This isn't my car. It belongs to the government. So you agree that it's wrong to use the cars for personal use? Yes, 100%. But these rules have to be applied without exception. In some cases, I can't deny there might be an unfair judgment, but we are in an extreme economic situation. We're living off aid. At least if the same rules are applied to everyone, then it's fair. Anyway, that man is on official business, and he is fine to be using the car. I am optimistic. I am optimistic because we started, and I don't believe now that anyone will make the wheel return back because uh, uh, a man is not working alone. This is part of the political will of many, many people in Palestine now that they want to see Palestine with minimum corruption. On the whole, on the whole, I think you would see that it's been extremely successful. I think we've been not just pioneers in the Arab world and in the region, but that we have a very encouraging success story despite are very difficult circumstances. The day after winning his award, Mohammed is at the court to hear the judgment on whether higher government officials have unlimited use of government cars. He's hoping the court will uphold the strict interpretation of the law. And a departing government car doesn't go unnoticed. <sighs> this campaign is our biggest achievement, and we started from scratch. And now we have a new goal which is that after working hours, all use of the cars will be strictly prohibited. These people who are fighting corruption are reducing it bit by bit. Anyone who wants to be corrupt in government or in an organization will find it harder now because of them. You won't get away with much. That is the job they are doing. Thank Allah, I'm now safe and secure in the knowledge 
that I'm in the hands of the proper authorities and a man. The fight against corruption is gradually bearing fruit. Progress is slow and involves a change of culture within societies and the highest reaches of government. But with the help of groups like Transparency International and their local advocacy and legal advice centers around the world, small victories are accumulating. And today, another can be added, as the court supports Mohammed's standpoint. I'm really pleased with the court decision, so we can now get on with applying it. I'm very, very happy. I'm even happier than yesterday when I won the award. My heart is beating. I'm so happy, I don't know quite what to do. Should I go back to the office now, or should I go straight out on the street, putting the new ruling into action? Either way, I'm overwhelmed.